before this morning. The message is entitled, Paul, What a Change. And the overall message of this message is that God loves to save people. And this morning, as we begin this message, I want to begin by just reading the first couple of verses of Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and verse 12. This is the origin of Paul's message. The message that he's going to share, this is where it came from. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preach is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I told it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just pray that this morning, Father God, that the, the Holy Spirit move in an awesome and powerful way. God, we pray that you would guide and direct uh, your servant as I share the message today. Lord, this message is a message of encouragement, of just reminding us of how much you desire for folks to be saved. And Lord, as we look at Paul's life, we can draw illustrations from that, applications from that. Lord, right now I pray most that I may decrease, that you may increase in Jesus' name. Amen. The original message that Paul is proclaiming, as he says, I want you to know, brothers, that this gospel I preach is not something that man made up. And we can understand that. If we were going to make up the message, we would have some kind of scoring system involved. That is... You do this, and then God does this, and you do this, and you can be saved, and you do all this. And if you remember, the beginning of this message on the book of Galatians is about we are saved by the grace of God. It is not of ourselves. We haven't done anything except, except the working of his, what he did on the cross. That's what we've accepted. We've accepted that work. We know Him as Lord and Savior, and we proclaim that, but it is God's grace that we're saved, not ourselves. And Paul is reemphasizing this here, that the message that he's proclaiming is not one that man has made up. As I said, if we were going to make it up, we would probably have some kind of scoring system. I mean, I mean, don't we deal with that a little bit in a Christian life? We always feel like that we got to do this, we can't do that, we do do this, we don't do that, and, and when we get all involved in all of that. But understanding this, that we are saved solely by the grace, the mercy of Almighty God, and that alone. Now, look at some of what was going on during that time. If you look at Matthew chapter 23 and verse 4. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 4. And it says this. And this we're talking about uh, the original Pharisees, those that were about works, uh, work salvation. And it says here, they tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Uh, again, we're talking about all of the requirements that they had. And some of the religions of today talk about you've got to do this in order to keep your salvation or to have your salvation. Salvation is a work of Jesus Christ and Him alone. Uh, truly, we do works, but we don't do that to be saved. As a result of being saved, we do works. Now, the message that Paul, Paul proclaimed, the message that the Pharisees, the religious leaders were teaching at that time that it's all about works, that you've got to do this. And they had all kinds of guidelines, all kinds of things <laughs> of what you could do, what you couldn't do. And it, it just became a big, big burden of having to do all the do's and don't do all the don'ts. Does that make sense? Hopefully. But in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, a familiar passage. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and it says, I will give you rest. I hope as a child of God you're experiencing rest in Jesus Christ. 
I hope your walk with Christ is not a burden. I hope it's brought about rest. Now, you know, we've talked about this many times. I won't go into great detail. But we don't give a list of do's and don'ts. We fall in love with Jesus and we know what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. Isn't that right? And Paul is saying, listen, the old thing was that of laws. The new thing in Jesus Christ is that you fall in love with Him, you give your life to Him, and then your life will be changed. So, the question has to come out, where do we get our gospel? Where do we draw from it? My, listen, friends, if you go out and, and look on the internet, that's probably, I, I should have looked it up, and I don't know, some, most times things on the internet are not always true. I, I guess you know that. <laughs> Where did you hear that? Well, uh, <laughs> check it out. Google it. Uh, but sometimes, friends, I listen, and I'm not saying all this is bad, but sometimes people say, what does this verse mean? And they'll Google it. We've got to be careful the answers you're going to get to that. Anybody can put anything on the Internet. <coughs> and we know that. So we've got to really be careful. And the question has to come about, where do you get your gospel? What do you believe? Paul's saying, listen, this did not come from men. I can, I can start off here and say, listen, my friends, the God we serve is a God of love. The God we serve is a merciful and gracious God. And that is accurate. Because God is gracious, and because God is merciful, and because God is a God of love, I'm convinced that that loving God would never send anyone he's love. And he wouldn't do that. Now my friends, we know when I said that's accurate, we know what I just said is not accurate. But it's amazing what people can begin to believe about the gospel just because they've heard it said or somebody that has a, uh, a magnetism about it as they proclaim it. They begin to take the gospel and begin to carve it out to what they want. And in this day and age, I'm really concerned for young people. My, my friends, when you start talking to young people sometimes about God and about Jesus and what all that means, they have some wild ideas. So it's the truth, and we, we've got to know the Word of God. And I, as I've told you many times on preaching, I hope that if there's ever a case that I preach something, that, that sometimes you on the way home say, oh, what do you mean by that? I hope you call me and say, what do you mean by that? I've told you before, I used to go, my preacher about every six months, I'd say, you know, you said something Sunday, and I, I want to know where you got that from. I don't mind that. We need to be in the Word of God. Amen. We've got to read it. We've got to know what it says. Another reason we need, we have to be involved in Bible study. My friends, even, I don't want to say more today than time gone, time's gone by, but there's so much junk out there that we need to know what the Word of God says. And Paul is saying here, listen, this message came from God. It didn't come from man. Don't let man decide for you what gospel you're going to believe. Through the Holy Spirit, we learn the gospel and the truth. Okay, number one, the change in Paul's life. Verses 13 through 15, uh, back in Galatians. First is pre-conversion. Now the if you know the story of Paul on the way to Damascus, he was knocked down. That was his change. Christ struck him down and talked to him, and he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. 
Now, I don't know if any of you have ever had the road to Damascus uh, experience, but there's some experience that we're going to talk to you that you have had, and we'll look at that. The pre-conversion, verse 13 and 14. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advanced in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the tradition of my father. <coughs> Excuse me. Of my fathers. Paul went around and pulled Christians out. To Stephen, if you remember in Acts, well, let's go there. Acts chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 3. Well, let's go to the story, verse 1. On a day of great persecution <coughs> broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all the reason I'm having trouble is because my Bible is missing. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'll be with you, Melvin. Just talk amongst yourself. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. You know what Paul was? A terrorist. He was having them killed. Because he felt so strong in Judaism and so anti-Christ, so Paul, Paul's pre-conversion, even after Paul got converted and he was going up to some believers, they said, whoa, 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 no. <laughs> we don't want that guy. Because we understand what he's going to do. He's going to get in the middle, middle of us and he's going he's to arrest us and persecute us and, and do all kinds of things. But Paul, one thing we truly see here in his pre-conversion, that he needed what all of us have received if you're a child of God, he needed grace. He had persecuted the church of Jesus Christ. Have you ever met somebody that, well, let me go by. I shouldn't tell this because it don't make me look good. I do that a lot, though, don't I? <laughs> That's okay. When I first started my relationship with Jesus Christ and really got serious with Christ, and we'd go to jails and prisons and preach. Well, even prior to that, I used to, I really felt the call to spread the gospel. But let me tell you how I had it wrong. I began to think about people that I could tell Jesus about that were pretty close to already being saved, or I thought, does that make sense? They weren't really bad people. And I had this naive thought that you know, there's some people out there that is beyond being saved. Have you ever been there? <coughs> have you ever gone back to a high school reunion and saw people that have given their life to Jesus Christ? You say, oh, whoa, whoa, hold on. I remember you. Or maybe, maybe you were the one. When you went back to high school reunion, they say, I remember you. And I don't think that's the case. I believe that's one reason God brought me through jail ministry and prison ministry. It's because God, I believe, was trying to show me that, listen, no one, listen now, no one is beyond being reached. You may have somebody in your family, you may have a friend, you may have somebody you know. And the logical thinking of the world would say, they are beyond that. My friends, this really is saying right here to you today, they're not beyond God's reach. No, never stop praying. Never stop praying for you. My wife prayed for her sister for many, many years. And 
she was faithful in doing that. I would pray that I was not as faithful as she was. Had the honor of baptizing her niece. Because of faithfulness, because of what God had done. So no one is beyond that reach. The reach of God. Continue to pray for those people. Let's talk about Paul's conversion. Again, back in Galatians chapter 1. Verses 15 and 16. But when God... I love that. <coughs> oh, man, I... I don't, this is one of those things that I'm so excited about. There is no way I can get you as excited as I am. <laughs> because if you will remember your life before Christ, and I hope, praise God, that I hope that you were raised and, and understood the things of Christ and you gave your life to Jesus Christ as a very young child. And you've always done that relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I want to tell you something right now. Because a lot of people say, well... When you ask somebody like that, would you give a testimony? Well, I don't really have one. Oh, you got the greatest testimony there is. You had a mom or a dad or a grandparent that told you and lived out the things of Jesus Christ. And it reaped benefits within your family. That is one of the greatest testimonies. We like the testimonies of where, you know, I said, I, I, I kick my dog all the time. God changed me from that. Or I murdered somebody. And God forgave me. And yes, that is great and that is powerful. But one of the greatest, greatest, don't ever forget it because Satan will try to shut you up about it. Don't do that. The greatest testimonies is ones that I've known Jesus all my life. And I've walked with him. He's been faithful to me. He's been faithful to me. But here in this conversion it says, but when God if you did not raise, if you were not raised and become a Christian at a young age, maybe you can say at one time in your life, or maybe you were raised a Christian. This happens sometimes. You were raised a Christian, and sometime in your life, you said, "You know what? I'm going to take this thing really serious." And your whole life changed. That was sort of my testimony. I was raised in a Christian home. My mother took me to church. Some people say they. Uh, <laughs> drugs got me to church I was drugged to church on Monday and drugged on Wednesday and every time the church opened I was drugged there um, so drugs had a lot to do with my uh, religious background but hear these words but when God when God got a hold of me when I let God have full control of my life but when God, it all changed. My life was so much drastically changed. It was a new difference. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, I am a new creature. I think differently. I act differently. I walk differently. My whole life has changed when God. And that's what is so powerful. I think what folks... I could probably say that over and over again for the next 15 minutes and say, let's go home. Because for me, this is it. But we in God. And I hope you can stand up here today and say, but when God, there's a point in your life that you're able to say that. Now, does that mean you turn perfect and everything's gone well? No, not at all. It's not that. But when God came into my life, it changed. Hallelujah. Man, that's when y'all will say, praise him, get back up there, we need to sing something. You gotta think you write a song, but when God. I think that'd be pretty good. Any songwriters here? Don't have to be a singer, just be a songwriter. The conversion, but when God, God's intervention, God moved in. But when God who set me apart from birth. Oh. Set me apart from birth. Paul says, God, 
who set me apart from birth. Now you go back and say, hold on, hold on, Paul. If he set you apart from birth, you really went, you went on the wild side, didn't you? How many of you have said a little bit in your testimony, well, I used to be a little bit on the wild side. I've heard people say that. What this shows is the patience of Almighty God. He is so patient with us, isn't he? Man, and hallelujah! Talking about maybe I won't say this, but when God, but maybe I may, let's do this. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, watch this. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his, watch this now, might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. But when God and God's unlimited patience, I am so thankful that God is unlimited, has unlimited patience with me. We don't have very good patience. How many of you have uh, just have great patience? I see somebody going, no, somebody looking at somebody else. <laughs> It's a twitch in your neck or what it is, but <laughs> well, listen, my friends. You realize that we know this. We're all just a bunch of folks, uh, forgiven sinners here. That's it. And my hope and my dream and my prayer is that throughout this week. As the end of the week comes, I will, I will be a forgiven sinner, and I know I will be. But I'd also like to say I won't have as many sins as I had the week before that, but sometimes, boy, that happens, doesn't it? Sometimes we just plain let God down, don't we? And then Satan wants to tell us. <laughs> well, you're a good one. But listen, my friends. God is a, is a forgiving, loving God. He has patience. I'm so thankful. So Paul in his conversion, there was the intervention of God. But when God, then there was God's eternal plan, his unlimited patience. Folks, today, I hope you leave here understanding one thing. You are, if you're a child of God, you are heaven bound. I hope you wake up with that each and every day. Don't allow Satan to burden you. As Libby sort of talked about, uh, you know, the good angel and the bad angel and all that. Don't do that. God has unlimited patience. Oh, does it mean that we just go out and do what we want to? So that grace may abound? That's what Paul says well. No, it's not that. We're in love with Jesus. So we're going to live our lives according to that. But we're going to mess up. We're going to make mistakes. Well, what about premeditated sin? <laughs> Have you ever been there? I know what I'm about to do is sin. And I'm going to do it. Now let me tell you a couple things. One, I had a dear grandfather that said, in essence, if you do a premeditated sin, you die before you you're able to ask for forgiveness, you're going to burn in hell. And 
I don't want, I'll be my bubbly there. My grandfather also truly believed that's the reason that if someone commits suicide, they will burn in hatred. Folks, that is not scripture. Listen, our sins are forgiven today, tomorrow, and forever. It's not us. That's what grace is about. It's about what Jesus has done. So Jesus died on the cross to cover all sins, but not this one and not this one. There is one sin that is unforgivable. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And that is basically or truly what it is, is denying who Jesus Christ is as Lord and Savior. You do that, it's unforgivable. It's not going to ever, you know, never going to get out of it. But let me tell you about premeditated sin. If you are a child of God, you're in the midst of one of the most painful, depressing times in your life. Because premeditated sin will eat you. God will forgive you. <coughs> God does forgive. And folks, I'm not trying. This is from the Holy Spirit because it's not down here anywhere. If you notice, I ain't glanced down here anymore. But there is victory in Jesus. Now let me tell you right now, if that is part of your life, give it to God today. Don't take it home with you. Do not allow Satan to say, God doesn't love you. God is tired of fooling with you. God is frustrated with you. You ought to be down. You ought to be depressed. You ought to be sick. You ought to be that. You ought to be that. Listen, tell Satan to get out of here. God wants us to live victorious lives, folks. And there is victory in Jesus. There is victory in Jesus. There is victory in Jesus. Jesus said that he came that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Quit fighting it yourself. Give it to God. When you fall, when you fall into that, you pray for God's forgiveness and you get back up and say, come on. Let's walk. And when you do that, don't hold on to it. Just hold on to God. Let it go. That's what God wants you to do. <coughs> Let it go. It's God's grace. And I know God, I, folks, I don't know why it's just been on my mind so much in, in the last couple weeks, and I know that you, you've heard me say this so many times, and and I'm not going to apologize for it. But one of the greatest tragedies, I believe, as a parent is to see your child hurt and you know there's a way that that pain can be removed. And to imagine somehow, and I don't even know if this is fair, but imagine somehow our Heavenly Father, seeing His children hurt, even because of premeditated sin. And God says, if you will just, just let me in. Just let me in. <coughs> Folks, I, well, I won't go, go back there anymore except for one last point. I remember a long time ago an evangelist, I don't remember where I heard it. I think it was an evangelist, maybe, maybe it was this picture. But it said if you go into a house and, and uh, you know, we just bought a home, and one reason we bought it because almost everything had re been redone. If you go by our house today, our screen door is laying on the side. It fell off this week. Well, it fell off halfway. I had to take it off the rest of the way because. Boomer couldn't get in. <laughs> but 
But if you've ever redid a house, and say you redid a house and you brought people over to say, I want to show you all that's been done. And say you were able to do all of the house but one room. And that one room just looks bad. You know what, on the way home, people are probably talking about, yeah, it looks really good, but did you notice it? Why didn't they, or save some of the money from this one, at least do something with that one. Now, folks, I want to get serious with you for just a moment. Is there a room in your life, and only you and God knows, is there a room in your life that you have not given to God? You've allowed access to your whole life, but there's one room that you've just said, not now. Not now. I want to hold on to it for a little while. You remember in the, the plagues that was in Pharaoh, and one of them were the frogs. You remember that story of the frogs? And the story goes something like this, that God brought on... Uh, run on the frogs to uh, as a punishment as a play for them uh, not doing what God wanted them to do. And they brought the Moses brought the Pharaoh in and said, when would you like me to get rid of those frogs? Now listen, they've been everywhere. I mean, I'm not talking about, oh, you go frog here. I'm talking about frogs everywhere. I mean, the stink, the, I mean, into everything, open up drawers. Oh, did they have drawers? Anyway, they um, <laughs> Opened up camels. And they found. Anyway, there were just all kinds of frogs. Really, really bad. And they asked the Pharaoh, when do you want me to get rid of those? What would I have said? Right now. He said, tomorrow. In essence, saying, give me one more night. Has there been a part of your life? I use the room as an example. That you say, Lord, and I believe, you know, I, I love you, God. And and, uh, and folks, I'm not doubting that. And I don't know, my goodness, I'm not, this is from the Holy Spirit. I don't know who this is from. <laughs> but God's saying, share it. But is there one aspect of your life where you're saying, God, uh, one more night? <coughs> one more night. One more night. And folks, I'm not sharing that, and I don't think the Holy Spirit is letting me to share that to be, hey, that's not it. Not at all. It's about God as a Father. As we would do as a parent, say, Oh, you can be relieved. You can be relieved. Some of you may have heard of David Berkowitz. He was the son of Sam Killer in the 70s. Did some horrendous things. Killed six women, mangled others. I barely remember that. I remember the song. I've sort of always been a supporter of capital punishment. I don't want to go to a big thing there. Don't, don't jump to any conclusions. We can talk if you want. And certainly I would think what that man deserved was for his life to be taken as well. They said that when he went to prison, but what happened? He believed he heard from dogs that dogs were speaking to him to commit these crimes. And that one place he lived, there were several dogs that howled, and he believed that they were howling for the blood of innocent people. He moved somewhere else, and there was a man named, by the name of Carr that I don't really remember his name, and that's good, I don't need to memorize that stuff. 
there was this neighbor that had a black Labrador retriever, and he believed that black Labrador retriever was telling him to, uh, to kill innocent people. He shot and killed the Labrador retriever, but then he was convinced that the owner of that now was having something to do with that. Uh, I don't know all that wild stuff. When he got to the prison, they said that he would go in the back rooms and we would hear him howling. And we know that his, his name is David Berkowitz, but they call him uh, David Bazarowitz. He, a number of years back, I don't know exactly how much, gave his life. He is now in prison, and if you get a chance to look at some of his videos now, uh, he will tell you about how Jesus set him free. Now, folks, you know the first reaction is, well, you may have been set free, but those six people will never be free. But my friends, I believe that he is a safe man. There is no one beyond God's reach. And God is so powerful that if you will say, God, this room is now yours. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I just pray that I was sensitive to the Holy Spirit, pleasing to you. That is my desire, Lord. Father God, today there may be decisions that need to be made. Father, they don't, they don't have to be made in public. That's, that's okay. I'll be happy to pray with anyone, Father God. But so many people just need to maybe, maybe pray while the song's going on and just speak to you. Maybe some just simply need to say, the room is yours. Today I'm saying, no more time with the frogs. I don't want one more day. I don't want one more hour. Some father may just want to pray, Lord, I'm just thankful that I've served a loving, a patient God that always forgives, that I don't have to leave my, live my life with my head bent down. I can live my life as a forgiven individual, striving to be more like Jesus each and every day. Oh, Father God, I could go through the whole laundry list of maybe why people may want to bow their heads and speak to you. But Father, I just ask today that your people respond to whatever's in their heart. Whatever the Spirit is leading, Father, respond today. In Jesus' name I pray.